operationalized as MOS infrastructure and systems that enable the experience. So some block balances performance and energy cost to prompt a game world where the material conditions for the possibility of that world are part of the This is bold project. There's nothing about the game that asks you to use less power. In fact, we want to make mods that use more power on purpose. Sort of reminiscent for those of you who, who have some familiarity with the we had an old rig and we used to overclock our computers, right? To get more performance out of them. It was fun to overclock your thing. So same sort of thing to draw more power on purpose to explore the, the kind of relationship that we might have to power with the game. Why would we do this? So that players develop a kind of, if you like, an energy infrastructural sensibility about forms of play as well as the myriad pleasures that might derive from that play. Could Sunblock prompt a whole new series of player-generated mods, mini-games, SMPs, fan fiction? Why not? Especially in the hands of, say, Mr. Beast, or Dream, I can dream, right? Like, if the YouTubers get this, it would be good. Uh, and of course, did I mention that Minecraft YouTubers consistently rank in the most watched YouTubes across all genres? I mean, we're talking about mass culture here. I would love to extend this eventually to players' client systems, a DIY power meter. You could send client energy data to the server, thus opening strategies for players to build or buy more efficient systems in the same way they currently build or buy more powerful systems. And a lot of this has to do with our computational imaginary, if you like. The ways in which we imagine and fetishize gaming technology are ripe here for reinvention. The current imaginary is something like this. But I would also argue we don't want something like this. Here, uh, we just substitute an imaginary of energy abundance of the petroculture for an uh, imaginary of energy abundance of solar culture. Nothing has to change about our energy consumption in this particular fantasy. Um, and that's one of the dangers of the planet. Um, for fun, I asked Stable Diffusion for some images of uh, solar-powered, low-carbon gaming rigs, and this is what it gave me. <laughs> <laughs> I love the left one. But yeah, this one's some kind of like bio that's reactor. Yeah, yeah. It's like a bio lab. <laughs> <laughs> so part of the argument here is that successful energy transition requires cultural intervention, not just technical, economic, political intervention. And that as culture makers, we're not simply here to share a message that actually, in fact, the scientists, the politicians, and economists are already botching up pretty badly because we're not moving fast enough in energy transition. Um, some block one suggests that energy transition awareness, capacity, and action can spring from all gestalts which invalid. By now, every round, it should be standard toys and messing around equipment. Uh, and even, especially in Montreal, you should be having one for backup power because we have power outages all the time. So why doesn't everybody do this? We shouldn't be messing with generators. We should be having a solar panel. That this scale has not yet become everyday culture should be the worry, not whether this or that politician has the guts to make a law. Minecraft is everyday culture. Some block one is an experiment in allowing any number of the millions and millions of players around the globe to simply have more fun playing. When carbon neutrality becomes as fun as taking down the Ender Dragon, then we know they will actually be hoping. things of course I'm planting is the sort of background of the whole project as we begin to now think about well what can we do uh, with the data that we're collecting and the kind of um, the, the kind of ways in which we can I mean that's partly kind of like whether any thoughts have come in people's mind what would be fun to do um, for Minecraft players this will be easier to think about uh, in the room uh, than maybe people who've never played Minecraft before uh, but as we begin to open the door, the idea right, is to start making a series of, sort of 
mods which test hypotheses uh, about bringing players into an engagement with the energy infrastructure that makes the game possible. So what would that look like? How would that be interesting? Um, and that's the next phase of the project. Question thoughts? One little thought. Um, the uh, Quite a few thoughts, really. Um, when you said when you're flying, there comes a point where I can't fly anymore, I've run out of steam. If you take all those metric things, um, but represent them as um, you know, commodities, resources in the game, so the, the, the gas in the tank, um, some, some sort of, so I mean, it's, I just thought that you could have a lot of sort of fun playing with that because you're making people think about something they care about in the game world, some resource, and it has this direct, very direct correlation to one of the things about the hardware. I, th I think so. I mean, that's one of the first things we thought of right away, right? Because this, this would become a game about conservation. So essentially about energy conservation, right? So uh, part of it is a, ga is a game balance question. So at what point does it become interesting to conserve energy, mm. right? Because if your game will last, you know, I don't know, a month, it, it's too long to worry about whether you're going to conserve energy in any given mm. time that you're playing. But if the game itself if the game itself might only last a few hours, mm -hmm. um, then you might make choices, right? And of course, uh, that's on the that's on, on one dimension. And the other dimension, which I'm really interested in, is the social dimension. It gets way more interesting when there are a lot of people flying around or want to fly around, and they figure out that collectively the cost of that is quite huge. Um, and so, part of the game design challenge is to up the stakes. For conservation to say well you know if you hang <coughs> on a bit longer you might get to experience this extra thing or if you want you can <coughs> indulge your whim fly around end the game and it'll be done at this point so you start playing with players sensibilities around what's possible and and of course if that were just a single player logic I think it would become uninteresting very very quickly at least at that level mm -hmm. because it, the options would be pretty clear, and you try it once, and, and that would be done. But in a multiplayer setting, uh, it's a much more dynamic and emergent scenario, which could take different forms. So that's probably where we're going to focus, and that's why we're focusing on server, the server game, mm -hmm. instead of, for instance, the client. Mm -hmm. So as a single player game, we could do the same sorts of things, and I think people are trying it. Uh, but we think uh, so. One of the cool things about the server is also it's invisible to players. So when when a Minecraft, well, when you play on any multiplayer server, you tend not to think about the conditions which are making that game possible. You're worried about your own machine, is it working, is it lagging, and all that kind of thing. But you don't really think about the server until it like goes down, and then you're all pissed off, and like all that kind of thing. But generally, you take it completely for granted. So it's a nice kind of analogy to the way in which we're moving to cloud computing and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so we think that's nice. I think on some, I'm thinking about like multiplayer servers, more advanced multiplayer servers. Sometimes you do see this negotiation already, especially with things like automation, like large redstone contraptions. Right. You think about lag, you think about a uh, large amount of entities uh, in spawn chunks or something. And like, so you have a little bit of that negotiation, like one player might want to build something that's really elaborate and maybe not very efficient and it might just like ruin that's it. the lives of everyone else like you know that's we've... great yeah because <laughs> you can imagine uh people building these huge redstone systems mm -hmm. that would take hours to run mm -hmm. and if the power weren't mm -hmm. up long enough they wouldn't get the resources that they've worked so hard mm -hmm. to achieve right so again this uh, especially in the industrial automation version of minecraft this becomes really interesting um, because they'd have to take the energy of the infrastructure as mm -hmm. uh, into the equation of into the calculation of what they're doing. And maybe even build different kinds of redstone systems. Well, I'm specifically thinking about the the light detector yeah. and like how that might be a really interesting device to incorporate into a solar powered server. And... Interesting. Is that right, Jim? Uh, you, you point out a fantastic thing where because it's a multiplayer, there's that tension here that individual actions and costs, the potential actions have been collected. Um, I wonder precisely because you focus on multiplayer. Number one, who is your audience? You know, other students. The you know uh, amount of people within a server that you might let run on. Who and can 
you expanded beyond just students, you know, coming together to talk about it. You could, you know, be branched out to some of the some of the type of policy makers, parents, teachers. Yeah, so so part of I think what we've been trying to argue, especially to academics who do this work, is that we're we're selling ourselves short if we just aim to create these niche experiences for academics. <laughs> And part of what Minecraft offers, I've always argued, is a statistical array which like greatly exceeds the potential for any audience of most stuff that we do. So when we're talking about uh, millions and millions of Minecraft players, so that's vanilla Minecraft. Of those, how many play modded? Okay, a few million play modded. Of those, how many might touch uh, or, or toy around with our solar server if I made it public? and offered mods to play it. What, a few thousand? I don't know, I'm still doing way better than anything I've ever done in my life, if I can tap that in any way, shape, or form. So I'm not interested, I mean, I think there's educational uses here, obviously. I think this will be an amazing school project, for instance, and Minecraft education is huge, and it could be, you could see schools totally getting into this, they use Minecraft in schools and all that kind of stuff, um, and in other kind of niche things, but the real target and I, this is an argument to game studies. The real target should be the player base of Minecraft. Um, and that's, that's the whole point of this, I think. Yeah. Um, thanks, Bart, for your presentation. I find it fascinating to learn more about this project and to understand it better. And as a side note, it's interesting because the, the aeronautic industry, because you speak about flying and, and, and walking, I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> no, right? <laughs> <laughs> Aeronautic industry, like the, all the international rule, uh, you know, regulations, they all have to go uh, to 2050. So I find it fascinating to think about the impact of flying within the game. But what I was thinking, and uh, I was thinking, and I don't know, I'm not a game developer. Is there a possibility to uh, to think about, say, low carbon materials within Minecraft uh, in terms of? Uh, what what do you use, and what is the the, the carbon uh, the carbon impact of those materials or or, or those objects or, oh, or yeah. those used, or and something I was thinking, in, but this relates more to the our pico power residues. Think about players, but not just as humans, but also as more than humans, and see like when the game is not like uh, uh, in demand, it can give back in real life to something. Like I was thinking about like example. Uh, if it, it, it harvests solar energy, not much is happening, and it give back part of its energy, say, to sustain the pump of an algae-based uh, cell battery. Oh, yeah. It's like, to just to, 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 to split that between the game and real life. Ah, that's a, two, both super interesting things. The, the low carbon materials, I, re, I really want to think about. So, so, there, this, this brings up the relationship between the diegetic and the non-diegetic layer. So the diegetic layer would be the references to solar ecologies that we could put in the game. So there's nothing, we can make solar panels. The question is, what does that mean? Yeah. Right? So you can put a, have a block that's a solar panel that gives you fictional energy for your fictional kind of thing. That's really different than the real energy <laughs> that's powering the thing. So trying to draw the relation between the non-diegetic and the diegetic when it comes to the materials is good. So Rosie's point about yeah. industrial production that's it. could work. In other words, certain diegetic materials could be tied to a non-diegetic processes. Yeah. So players would have to build factories that would accord to the non-diegetic constraints and in return, they'll get diegetic materials. So some kind of newfangled you know, bioplastics. I mean, how much something. coal is the <laughs> Why not? Well, I mean, we can make anything, right? We yeah, can yeah, yeah. make any material, but, yeah. and we can make them fun to build with. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, and, and so part of this, the other paper I'm going to give in the summer at the Serious Games Conference is addressing the difference between people who make Minecraft games to teach kids about energy transition and, and energy conservation and the kind of game they'll play. So in one is purely diegetic. It's like solar power is good. Go and put a fake solar panel on your fake house in Minecraft and be happy. So that's one kind of learning. And maybe they're understanding some kind of relation between 
how electricity works and batteries or something. Usually there's a little module that teaches them this. They don't actually learn it from the game. Whereas what we're doing is providing a direct experience. So the more diegetic materials uh, are more diegetic context we can tie to the non-diegetic one, the better and more robust the experience will be. So a really good obvious one, which is not a ecological one, is a solar powered swords. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got your sword like that you that. use to fight the mobs, and of course it does more damage when the charges, when you've got the higher voltage coming in off the sun, right? Yeah. So it's like, of course, what player would love that? So you're going to desire to have a relationship with the weather outside, right? So you're going to save your big fight, right? For when your sword's going to be peak <coughs> right? That's what I'm talking about. So we need similar sorts of things uh, around the other aspects of the game. Um, and, I, and that's why I think this will be super exciting. And then the other thing that makes this even more exciting is it's not we don't have to constrain it to the research team itself. We can throw open the whole question to the modding community and say, what do you think would be fun to play with? Because it's an open source community. They can fork and change and modify and redistribute anything that we come up with, right? So the dream there is, is quite big if we can hit the sweet spot in terms of what's interesting to play with. Because as soon as they're told you should like play less and like use less energy, they're not going to care. <laughs> I'm thinking about what you said about wanting to have mods that encourage more power use and it might be interesting to find a way to connect the the charge of the battery to the day to night cycle in the game so that you know if it's fully charged it's daytime but sometimes you want it to be night yeah um so maybe you want to drain the battery so you can do uh some of the things that you need under the, to do under the yeah, well, so if you train the battery the whole thing shuts down so we're trying to play but it like you know if it gets to like yeah, 25 percent exactly then, then the it's nighttime and then you and have mobs come out. Yeah, this yeah. much time to get your work done before it's over <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could be neat. yeah I mean, one of the mods we talked about right away which is very easy to do is just do real time mm -hmm. so like the sun rises when it, which makes sense if you are thinking about playing in game and the sun in game should match the sun outside so at least where the server is mm -hmm. so that you can Problem is, it's really boring to play 12 hours and do like 12 hours at night time. <laughs> like that's, that's pain in the ass. I, I did play a game like that and I didn't figure it out until I realized <laughs> I only ever logged in at night. Yeah. <laughs> so we gotta, we gotta figure out uh, how to get around that. But, it, but again, it's, it's all about that balance, right? Um, and what becomes sort of, it's, it's typical game design language. What's juicy? What's juicy enough for the player um, to enter into this kind of uh, you had the other question, which is like, um, it's more like, like, if this is a way energy, yeah, like, that you, know, be... you know, when the grid, how the grid is resilient, like, like, yep. you know, uh, is there a way that to give the pico power back to some kind of real life system? Yeah, could it sustain a garden? Could it sustain like uh, something that waters plant? Could it sustain that? Uh... Yeah, and to make that a choice in games. So yes, for instance, that's it. If you play conservatively, you could, can, maybe then you some can of the power can be used for something else. That's it, physically. So you so that's you bring, a great idea. Like, so you bring the game outside the game, actually. Yeah, even more than it would be normally. That's yeah, um, that would be amazing. And then we'd have to figure out how to get information about what the power is being given to back to the player. Well, that's it so that they could yeah. sort of like take care of the garden from inside of the No, the, the algae battery first. Okay. The garden battery. <laughs> <laughs> I need, I need the, I need pickle power. Right, so, right, right. Sorry. Since you're introducing the idea of scarcity of electricity into the game of Minecraft, you're also introducing the idea of scarcity of power because whoever has the most electricity you ration it for everybody if you give every single person a battery and say hey you have two hours of flying time or two hours of your uh, solar powered sword how are you going to use that and who decides who gives it to people uh, uh, oh yeah what would be the mechanism for doing that so to have somebody control <laughs> the distribution oh basically someone to control the server essentially um, yeah, so right now, and this is why I, I, every time 
we make a discovery, it's like, oh my God, this is directly analogous to the social situation right now. Solar power is a commons, it's a collective resource. <laughs> Everybody has access to the same thing. The, what comes after is power distribution and imbalance because people are greedy or socialistic or whatever, right? So that's exactly mirrors exactly what's happening in society today, right? Um, do you make a new social contract so that people protect the common resource together? Do you, you know, uh, limit some people's access and other people get more access? There's all kinds of, so everything you can imagine uh, kind of as a scenario that's come up in our heads just inside of this game. Never mind the flying thing, which was the minute we did is exactly what we said. It's like, oh yeah, like clearly this is going to encourage local transport, <laughs> right? So uh, one of the big things about Minecraft, uh, even in the worlds we play, is that everybody flies so easily. It's very easy to get your wings. Um, and nobody like hangs out together. They all fly off and do their own thing. So it's actually flight encourages this kind of individualistic mode of play where everybody goes off and then creates a sort of island paradise of their own in different parts of the world, which is going to be the most expensive, energy expensive thing you can imagine doing. Boom! It's like, holy shit, yeah. In fact, living in small groups in localities and doing all of your resource distribution in a small area is a smarter thing for the planet. <laughs> um, and so we can, it's like it demonstrates itself. You don't have to say a word. You don't have to say a single word. It just unfolds. Um, and that's perfect series of game physics. That's exactly how it should work. But yeah, I mean, we got to play around with that more. Think about the political dimension even more, but like, yeah. Any other ideas? That's great. Just looking at the graph of energy usage for flying, the like, the dips, is it, is it just loading the new chunks that's drawing power or is that anything like boosting with a rocket versus gliding? So we have to do all of that work now. So Sharon started to do all the forms of mobility so that we can start to piece it together. So we have okay. boating, running. So curi yeah, I'm curious about like so it is, horses So it's got something boats. to do with chunk loading. And we also know that in regions that are where the chunks have already been loaded, the power draw is less than exploration. So exploration of new chunks costs more than, it, than moving around in existing chunks to a degree. Um, but beyond that, we don't know whether we will see discrete differences like in the kinds of flight. We, have, we think it has to do with the speed right, that you're moving. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is also the beginning of testing other sorts of things. So if it's only motion, it's only movement that's interesting, I'll be sad. That's why we were doing the tests with the golem and the magma cubes, because if you know magma cubes, they all divide once you hit them. And so I wanted lots and lots of entities. And there, that was the end of the battle. There were like thousands of entities all over the place. Uh, but I fear the client is doing all the work there and not the server, uh, because we, I didn't see very much. Um, the fire was a little bit better. So the fire in the nether is particle effects. Um, and the CPU temperature went up. But the system, Meta. the system, yeah, I know, but the system <laughs> power consumption did not. So part of what's going on is we have to get our measurements right, and so we're now starting to measure the complete. Uh, so the power draw we were measuring was the CPU power draw, not the whole system load. So for instance, when the fan is running, it's going to add a whole bunch of extra power. So the temperature can spike, the CPU can be doing its <laughs> thing, but the temperature might spike. The fan will go on and we'll draw more power that way. Mm -hmm. So we have to do all of that work, and then we have to do other sorts of tests. So the next thing is to add players. So we're very scientific. We're gonna do one player every 15 minutes and take new measurements and see what the changes are. And then we start adding mods, because then we haven't even, we only have our one visualization mod. So then we'll start adding mods, existing mods that already are out there. Probably I will design a kind of solar punkish type mod pack because it seems appropriate. Um, and we will test how many mods we can kind of load on before the thing breaks and won't work anymore. Um, and then what the power consumption is. And then Sharon will start making some mods that um, both use the existing data 
and also enhance that existing data. So the idea is to design mods that say, uh, make the server perform useless calculations so that we drive up power consumption just for the hell of it, right? So it's just a, a box that, you know, basically consumes power. Um, so these kinds of experiments. I, I like the idea of it within the game. It encourages people to have to discuss and agree, come up with their own way of agreeing how they're going to get that surplus or the extra power that they want, whatever it is. So they, they kind of, there's this basic, everyone gets a rudimentary amount of power just to be able to walk around and do the basic, basic subsistence functionality, which isn't necessarily that fun or that fun for very long so everyone's like motivated to want to do more um, but they and they know and they can see somehow you know there is power available to all but not for everyone at the same time right so so you get some mechanics of negotiation bartering agreement voting I don't know all the sorts of things you might think or maybe it's not as benign as that and and an experiment with and see what what comes out of social social contracts get born out of you know this sort of mad max scenario where we're all fighting over a perceived limited resource and we have to come to some agreement i don't know but it feels like the right yeah you know I, virtual I, space to and do and that. i think the key argument right is that we don't have to m create motivations from scratch we're not making a game from scratch we're rolling over motivations that are intrinsic to the game already mm. It's like we're rolling with it. So it's like judo or something. We're taking those motivations and then moving them in another direction rather than having to create a game about energy transit and then sort of tell people, this is your motivation. Go. Do you, do you buy it or not? We take the existing motivations and we twist them. Um, so I think that's where the sweet spot of this argument lies um, and why it's important. I mean, Minecraft obviously isn't the only game one could tackle with this kind of thing. There's plenty of other games one could look at, but Minecraft is a good candidate as an exemplar for this reason. Um, and that and the scale, you know, the carbon footprint scale, which is compelling. But speaking on the motivation part, have you given thought about, um, you know, if the power runs out, for example, and let's say it lasted seven hours, and they Will it reset everyone's progress, or if it charges again, people come back and they can continue where they left off? Because if it resets, it hammers more of the need to talk and strategize. It either becomes a stagnant thing. So if it didn't reset, interesting, people would just kind of oh, we'll just we'll Wait. play it safe. We'll play the game again, right? They engage more with the Ender Dragon thing. You know, only two people go at once instead of a whole crowd of people. Yeah. But if it had to end in seven hours, just like our time on planet Earth. We think, how do we mobilize it? Do we spend the next seven hours really making creative communes in like a, an island, archipelago, etc., or do we go together collectively to get Elytra and just yeah, you know, or something in between that? So that was our first our first scenarios were, what would a Minecraft game on a single charge be like? And then it would reset and you'd start the game again, and people would come to just experience an eight hour game, and we would. In a way, in a weird way, from a game design perspective, that's way easier to plan for than the typical open emergent Minecraft world where people play on indefinitely. Uh, so somewhere between like uh, the server, you know, the server runs out of charge, shuts down, everybody comes back when the battery charges again and plays on, and a single charge is some other kind of scenario we could also do where, you know, there's intrinsic penalties and rewards. For, um, for choices around. Because the only way to make a, an infinite game, so to speak, finite, is not to kind of you know, say what you can do, how much, it's to end the game. It's like you lose all progress. Yeah, and of, and of course, the key here is not to reward ecological play, mm -hmm. right? The key is to reward uh, creative decision-making, like creative choices, whether it's non-ecological or ecological. So you, for whatever we do, we have to, think like European board games here. We have to have multiple routes uh, that any, anybody can take in order to engage with the game. Um, because the danger of, of the ecological route, in other words, play this way or you can't play, uh, is to become didactic and, and ultimately boring after the first couple of tries, right? So there needs to be, and it's also really important from this point of view, you have to be able to play evil. 
It's super, super important to be able to be the evil player. And that has to be sustainable in any scenario, whether it be the single charge uh, cycle or multiple or indefinite. Um, because that possibility the player could choose, you know, today I feel like I want to fly around, God damn it. Um, they need to be able to have, have the option to think that even if they don't do it. Like that has to be a viable choice. And then their commitment skyrockets, right? So the moment they choose, they could do it, but choose not to is the moment they really identify and, and engage with the game. Right? And that's as important from a game design point of view. If the player thinks that they only ever had one choice, they just think that the developer is like running them through hoops. Okay? They need to honestly, sincerely believe that the choice is theirs. Um, Minecraft is a beautiful game that does this already. <laughs> right? So the last thing you want to do is wreck it. You, you don't want to wreck a beautifully, perfectly designed game want to actually just enhance that a little bit. So, um, and this is why I have so much trouble with like people who use Minecraft to teach <laughs> lessons about solar power. <laughs> Wrong game for doing that. There's better games for that than Minecraft. Because <laughs> all you're doing is saying to the kids, hey kids, you can't play, <laughs> but you can, you know, learn a lesson. <laughs> so. Do you know of any Minecraft communities who already use these kind of restraints to generate good game design role play So you could like take best practices for your project. Yeah, so that's a great question. So there are um, There used I mean it, it's gone away now, but in earlier versions of Minecraft 1.12 were the heyday of modding in Minecraft lots of different kinds of communities that glommed around different ways of playing um, different kinds of politics, like explicit politics, and even experiments in real, in real, in uh, sort of real data APIs and things like that in the game. That was the heyday of all that's kind of disappeared now in favor of this sort of diegetic kind of mods, you know, story worlds, richer story, beautiful, sumptuous, you know, environments and things like that. So less about the communities of players. But what has happened is that that notion of player communities has migrated to this like domain of what we call SMPs or uh, multiplayer survival servers, which attract a kind of following or a kind of community. It builds up around a particular way of playing. So we've dabbled with this idea in other kinds of projects, Minecraft projects, with a little success, but not as much as we'd want, and in part to tap into that, to say, because that's the key, right, is not just to make a game, but to make a server. So we'll make this server publicly accessible. I don't have, we don't have the time or energy to run it, but boy, would I give it to anybody who did, right? So if I could find players who wanted to like occupy the server and build a community around it, I would be overjoyed beyond belief, right? Um, and that would be theirs, and they could play it, and and build their community and, and so on and so forth with the constraints of our of our kind of system. Um, but you're exactly right, and that's where Minecraft becomes most most powerful. Right, is in communities, uh, networks of friends, and then communities that grow around those networks that glom onto servers that uh, some of them have gone on for years and years and years and years, and they're just these persistent worlds with people who have built houses there that are now like 15 years old. <laughs> um, and so that's the real. That, in fact, more than the massive player base of Minecraft, which continues to grow with, as kids um, start playing it, um, the longevity of the community is probably even more important for this kind of project. Right? Sharom, you wanted to say something. No. Come on, <laughs> what, what do you got in mind? What are you gonna build? Oh, do I have something to say, or did I have something to say? <laughs> <laughs> because my idea stemmed from you saying, solar sword because from the solar sword I brought in a solar suit which would make you reverse vampires you don't come out during the day uh, which uh, brings it something mm -hmm. I don't know where that's gonna lead uh, another thing I had in mind while you were talking was uh, you know how servers uh, put the computation behind it like uh, data centers put it all behind 
of the behind the wall or put it in a black box. The other way around, for us, the client right now is a black box. Yeah. We don't see the computation that goes on when we're rendering stuff. That could also come into the economy uh, as uh, what you're doing on your machine compared to what's happening on the server. Bring that into the calculation of how the player plays. Yeah. Which is not something we've considered so far. No, that would be the next horizon, right? Yeah. So either stealing their uh, the data off of their CPU, off yeah. of their boards, or encouraging people to, to have DIY sensors uh, that measure the power consumption on their machine. Because we can do that. I mean, uh, there are, for mods, there's client side and server side. So yeah. if they, we could just do the same computation on the client side, and that will work just Absolutely. the same way. Yeah. So another another concept from the world of carbon accounting, which maybe could show up somewhere, the, the idea of you've been talking a lot about operational um, carbon, essentially because it's I'm drawing down the power and I'm using it to power my sword. Right. But then there's embodied carbon, which is how much carbon as you're building something in your world, how much power did it take to build it? Now it's embodied in that stuff. Mm. Maybe that that's and, and then the, the the other concept is when you the end of life carbon, which is when you take down a building. What's the carbon you've used to do that process of taking it down, right? So embodied end of life and operational are kind of the big the big buckets. I think there's some other sub ones, but I don't know. Just whether there's say um, you are you kind of have got that. You've certainly got yeah. the embodied. So okay. this is the problem of going at the non diegetic diegetic carbon. I mean, what does that word mean? I never heard it before. So diegetic is like the the, the narrative world. This this. The, the, the world, the discursive world, the world that's presented to you, not the code, the underlying code. Right? Okay. So I live in this, in Minecraft, I live in this environment and I build houses. And so it's the fantasy of the game as opposed to the... It's like fantasy, but it is, it's closer to narrative. Right? Okay. So it's the, it's the world as it's presented to you. Okay. How you're meant to understand it. Mm -hmm. And the non-diegetic are all of the conditions which make that diegetic world possible, essentially. Okay. Um, including the player's own body and uh, comportment and all that. Uh, so, for instance, there is a mod that exists. It's an old mod that we're thinking of upgrading for 1.2.0, which is global warming mod. And it will uh, basically give you pollution, and it will increase the world's temperature with effects on in the world. But it's diegetic. That is, it's internal to the system. Okay, but it, that makes no reference to outside data or anything, right? That, you could use a mod like that to really understand or feel something, right? So the question is, like, should we be doing that kind of stuff? Or if we do that, will we confuse players about what the real relationship we're trying to explore is? So I'm, I'm now kind of, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Because there's some great mods. They're gorgeous, really well done mods that are wonderful to play. Pollution mods, people are big on those. It's great because you 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 know you build yourself an industrial, beautiful industrial factory, and then like I don't know, a few hours later, it's a wasteland because all the plants around have died, and you've got like smog over top of your your beautiful house and all the rest. So it's pretty point. It's pretty poignant and kind of interesting, um, and it's it would easily speak to all of these other features. Mm -hmm. So. The harder question would be how to operationalize any of the kinds of data we're collecting into these other, it's similar to Alice's question, right? Um, into any of these other kinds of sort of where carbon sits. Mm -hmm. One of the things would be nice would be to talk about the carbon cost of the gaming hardware, either that the server's using or that the clients are using. Um, so some way of uh, getting data about client systems. You mean the embodied carbon in yeah, the system? the embodied right. carbon in the system. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's data about this. I don't know how reliable that data is, mm -hmm. but if you know, you know what your graphics card is and right. the motherboard right. and all this kind of, there's, there's data about like the cost of that. Um, and then we can use that data as part of the cost of, like some kind of like sunk cost for the player in the game, mm -hmm. right? Um, even if they input it, like even if they like have to tell us about your system and they have to write what they have, what they're gaming with, 
right? We can use that and translate that and make that a sunk cost of some kind. Um, that would be closer. That would be closer. I mean, I like what you said when you, in the presentation. You said it's about exploring. It's about playing differently to how you normally play, playing in different ways as opposed to having different features. Is actually so. This makes me think you you might care about how many seconds you're playing for, or at what point in the day or night you're playing. Like caring about the temporal aspect of your gameplay. You know, it's not my choices of where I go in the game world as opposed to that's the normal set of choices. Yeah. So but that, I think that is a strong argument for shrink shrunk in mini games mm -hmm. and like the solar sword right so mm -hmm. basically we change the kinds of ways in which you fight in the game so it becomes impossible to fight anything under normal circumstances and you have to wait or mm -hmm. peek mm -hmm. so if the, for instance we could and there it's good because i want to use for instance more of the solar panel data so i've got the we're tracking the voltage is coming over the panel so as the sun reaches peak you get more voltage your sword will be stronger. As the sun goes down, it becomes less and less and less. That That is perfect for any kind of like boss fight scenario mm -hmm. kind of thing, right? And you've got a bit of hardware which um, equalizes out the, because the, the sun's energy landing on the, it's, it's all constantly varying, like right, the clouds and everything else. Could you get rid of that bit for a while? Just have like this very spiky power. I wonder the game. damage to the, I don't know. Yeah. Without a solar controller, I think our hardware's in trouble. <laughs> just just wind it down to only control to the minimum amount, so you, I don't know. Don't yeah, know. but the fluctuation is huge. Okay. So the okay. PV fluctuation during the day is really significant. So we're not talking about like fluctuation at any given moment of time, but mm -hmm. as time passes, mm -hmm. there's massive differences in the amount of power that's being generated yeah. by the panel. Yeah. So that, yeah. that's lovely. Yeah. That's really lovely. We haven't even begun to start thinking about using that yet. Uh, so mostly we're using the power consumption data, battery charge data we can use, which is the voltage on the battery at any given point. Uh, so all sorts of things like as the battery's going down, things can happen in the world, right? So if you let your battery drain at you know 30%, something happens. At 20%, something happens. At 10%, something happens. Then the world shuts down, whatever we do. Uh, so that's super easy. With, we're toying with all the scenarios there. So a lot of this may work better if you know anything about Minecraft as sort of a mini game sort of things, right? Where you announce we're all going to play this kind of Hunger Games scenario for a little while. Um, and I, my guess is a lot of the first things we'll do will be like that. Um, meanwhile, we will also think about this sort of longer world and what what. The A lot of your data is on movement, but it's horizontal movement because chunks are loaded in as like Correct. vertical chunks. Yeah. So yeah, you don't get it when you're jumping from a height. I tried that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a mini game that was created back in like the 1.12 days was this uh, when like world orders were added to the game or something like that. Yeah. It was you started on one block and you couldn't move outside of this one block. And you had to mine down, and then you get some materials, and then as you get more achievements to the game, your world order increases by a block. Right. And so it'd be cool to have something like that, maybe, where as you get access to more horizontal movement, you see like your increase in energy uses goes up. Because since vertical usage doesn't change anything, it's, it's an interesting di dynamic to that. Yeah, or something some version of that which makes use of the chunk loading mechanic because so like uh, essentially what we're trying to do is force the cpu to have to deal with the chunk loading problem because that drives up we want it to mm -hmm. spend energy if you like slowly creep along even horizontally there's hardly any effect like because because the computer has enough time to load the chunks so there's a little like but uh, what's really causing the energy consumption is that you're basically um, stacking up the, the chunk loading orders, essentially. So like the, basically the computer's being told, load this, 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 all within a very short space of time, and it's got to work it all out. Um, so the faster you move, the worse it gets. The slower you move, it can, it can handle it, essentially. So, but if we were to leverage that, with, for instance, teleportation is very good because teleportation forces the computer to redraw the world basically instantly <laughs> as you move. So the 
moment you move uh, in, uh, through another portal, there's a huge spike. And it goes away right away, but it's a lovely uh, little spike. So dimensional travel is very good or uh, teleporting um, around the world. So sort of similar. In other words, you could devise a game where that becomes more costly um, and either forcing you to like um, do better in your smaller space of time or giving you some interesting strategies for expanding your territory, which is what we're, the one block thing is all about, right? It's, it's a... It's a metaphor within a metaphor about colonial expansion. <laughs> yeah, cool. Any last thoughts? Thank you for the presentation. And as I have a question, um, the server, the solar server, uh, what does what is it like after? After? Yeah, you are, you are, it's a, this is like a test, no? Yeah, so right now, it's te so right now uh, we're in the testing phase. So part of the server question is, do we get our hardware right for the balance, right? So the hardware balance is a tricky thing. So uh, I'm liking the idle power of the nuke right now, but I don't know how many mods we can get away with. So that we will see. Uh, the battery is also interesting because the larger battery, a larger capacity battery means you can last longer on a single charge, which can be kind of depressing. So in fact, I want a smaller, a smaller capacity battery rather than a larger capacity battery. But I don't know if the battery we have gives me the sweet spot, right? So a lot of these questions we're not going to get scientific about. Uh, we're going to go with our gut um, and, and work that way because it'll be A, expensive and B, very time consuming to test every parameter. Um, then once we have what I think is a kind of sweet spot of the, of the threshold gaming idea, um, then we start like making it public. Um, and I'm very happy for it in, you know, for the near future for it to live as a public server. It's already public, like we've got our, our public connection, anybody can play it. I'll be inviting tons of people to do testing and things like that, but I want a community. I would like a, a kind of core community of basically hardcore Minecraft players to adopt it, essentially. Um, and that, that would be project success for me. Um, then that would be fine. If I could also convince like Minecraft EDU to take it on as a worthy project for schools or something like that, that would also be cool. But for our research, Right, it's about the game design parameters. Right, can we make this compelling so that Minecraft players would choose it other than one of the many other thousands of servers they might play? Is it interesting enough for a Minecraft player to, to, to choose as a compelling and interesting experience, let alone anything that gets written about or talked about on YouTube or anything like that? Um, and then, of course, the, the mod thing, which is what I'm very serious about, because having watched and studied modding communities forever, I know what they're capable of. So students here are great, but it takes us forever <laughs> to get these things done. But the modders out there in the world, they turn over amazing shit in like 24 hours. Like I, it's amazing what uh, people will do for fun when it's fun. Um, and so if this was compelling enough, right, and we offer an API to say, okay, here's our server, we've got this data running, uh, make some months, go, you know, um, design whatever you like, and we'll test it. And, um, and it's easy enough also to even go the next step and provide an instructables for how to build our system and provide all the script for free and so on and so forth. Because again, it's not that expensive. The whole thing would probably be done for 500 bucks, 600 bucks or so. Um, so in that sense, I'm pretty ambitious. <laughs> um, but it's not so much about whether this will all happen. It's really an argument. I'm trying to make the game studies people about you should imagine a project where it might happen. That's a good project. So imagine a project where this could be a possibility and design your project that way rather than imagining uh, that you'll only ever talk to three people. Because that's kind of depressing. Like we're pushing forward the allegorical idea. A little bit. Like, I mean, I don't know how to explain it now. But allegorical idea here is um, 
that in the hands of open source, relatively communistic kind of makers, um, a lot of things could happen, right? That, that if the hardware, if the problem of energy transition, would, if, if makers got access to this, uh, a lot more could happen than if it was kept behind these sort of corporate and high technology kind of doors, right? Um, that we see even in the Pico Power space, and it's too bad Alice is gone because one of the reasons why we're doing research on Pico Power, so Pico Power is essentially very, very small energy production systems. So energy harvesting at microwatts or picowatts, but it goes up pretty high. You can get like 100 watt Pico systems, but they're DIY. Essentially DIY. I mean, it's not quite that way because there's scientific instruments, you know, that like remote scientific instruments that run on Pico Power and stuff like that. But essentially, for you and I, if you want to create power, it's really easy to do in very small quantities that are pretty useless from a point of view of energy transition. Energy transition people are worried about cities and buildings, shit that Chris has worried about. <laughs> Uh, so we're excluded. We're simply excluded. Um, and so part of the argument about Pico Power is it's Tez's phrase is Pico Power for the people, right? Pico Power to the people, right? That that contribution and participation in energy transition should happen where you are. Um, and so one of those places is in the kind of maker DIY open source kind of culture. Um, where um, all this can happen. So this is the overlap, the allegorical overlap between a, a, an idea of Minecraft as a world you build and you can be a builder, not just by making things in the world, but by making the conditions that make them in the world, right? Uh, with uh, the equivalents across that and software hackers, DIY makers, the stuff that goes on in, in all the labs around here. Um, so we're trying to create these openings um, where uh, at the same time we're trying to argue to uh, people in control of the energy transition, which is not us, um, that maybe they should listen to us a bit more, <laughs> right? Uh, as culture makers, not as um, scientists or engineers or CEOs or politicians. Um, right? And that's part of, I think, the fun of the bigger And it's a tough sell to talk about Minecraft, to talk about that at the same time. It doesn't seem connected. Um, but yeah, cool. Well, I enjoyed this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Very nice to have been able to say it all. <laughs> I like what you said about um, uh, is a win if people prefer to play Minecraft with solar power. Like that, that actually, that, that is brilliant, isn't it? Because I mean, that is getting people, not forcing people to be eco-friendly, but